All righty. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the February 2023 meeting of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. I'm Glenda Bullock. I'm the program chair of the CHAA, and I hope your day is going well. We are so pleased today to have with us Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz of the Stratford Hall Historic Preserve in Stratford, Virginia. And she's going to be talking to us on the role of enslaved cooks, the role that enslaved cooks played in inventing American cuisine. Our online host for today's program is the Ann Arbor District Library. They provide promotional and tech support for us on Zoom, and we are ever so grateful to them uh, for making our programs available to uh, our viewers really from coast to coast. Uh, you can find recordings of many of the Culinary Historians programs on the library's YouTube channel, which is AADL TV. And uh, by now we're all pretty familiar with Zoom and how that works, but if you don't uh, want your face to show during the recording, please turn off your video. Your microphone will be muted during the talk, um, but uh, Kelly will take questions at the end as time allows. And you can post your questions and comment in the chat feature and select uh, AADL as the recipient. And one more tip at the top of your screen, there's a button that says view. You will want to click speaker view or side-by-side -side view instead of gallery view for your best viewing experience. Uh, for any newcomers who are joining us today, uh, we'd like to share a little information about the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. We're an informal group of people who are interested in the history and culture of food and cooking. And our group was founded in uh, 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 about 40 years ago, as a matter of fact, and new members are always welcome. We have monthly talks between September and May. Since the pandemic, most of our meetings have been on Zoom, um, but we are starting to add back in some in-person talks as well. In fact, next week, we're going to have our first in-person meeting of the year at the downtown Ann Arbor Library. But for those folks who are watching outside of the Southeast Michigan, uh, the program will also be streamed online. Uh, we have twice yearly potluck meals, which have a theme. Usually these meals are in December and July, and our December meal featured food from the British Isles. If you're not a member of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor, we would love to have you join. Our membership is $25 a year, and that's for an individual or a family, and it includes a subscription to our quarterly magazine, Repast, which is edited by Randy Schwartz. If you'd like to join our group, you can find membership information on our website, culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org, uh, and click on membership. And you can also find us on Facebook. Just search for Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor and like our page to get our news into your timeline. And now I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce today's speaker. Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz is the Vice President of Collections and Public Engagement at Stratford Hall in Virginia. She earned her PhD at UC Berkeley in uh, African Diaspora Studies, and she is a visiting scholar there. She is the author of Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. She's also contributed to the Rutledge History of Food, National Geographic History, and Smithsonian Magazine. She's an historian, an archaeologist, a material culture enthusiast, an historical consultant, a museum professional and author, and she is today's special guest. So on behalf of the culinary historians of Ann Arbor, welcome Kelly Fanto Dietz. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Glenda. Thank you to the CHAA. And thank you all for Zooming in today. I am always excited to talk about this particular work. Um, and you'll probably understand why as I walk through my slideshow and give you my lecture today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Just give me one moment here. Kelly, you're muted. Happened when we're practicing. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. Something about sharing that screen made it all weird. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna start from the top. Um, all right, I'm here today to talk about the work um, for my book, Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. I was a professional chef for 10 years. And then when I became a historian and an archeologist, I found a deep love for the archives and I have dedicated my entire life 
to testifying on behalf of the things that I have found in the archive and the people that I have interviewed who are descendants of those once enslaved in America's earliest kitchens. The purpose of my book is multifold. It is to give credit to the thousands of enslaved African and African-American chefs who toiled uh, along the the Eastern coast um, throughout the South in the kitchens that created American cuisine to bring their stories to light and as well as uh, doing culinary justice work. And that is a phrase termed uh, coined by Michael Twitty, who is a friend of mine and a phenomenal culinary historian as well. And also to bring attention to some of the kitchens that still stand um, and a lot of these plantation sites like we have at Stratford Hall. And most importantly, and I, I start with this very sobering purpose of this book because I think we all need to get on the same page before I launch in to this research, but I wanna tether the romance of food to the reality of enslavement. So I know a lot of folks that love food and they're culinary historians and they zoom into talks like this. They wanna hear all about the recipes and today we're we're going to be talking about the recipes a bit, but we're going to be giving credit and attention to those who were forced to cook those recipes and those who also brought their training and their passion and their own recipes to America's early colonial tables. So we're going to be focusing on a few things today. We're going to be focusing on myths, um, what myths were surrounding these enslaved chefs until the last 10 years or so when a lot of rigorous work has been done to sort of um, sort of unbind them from these myths. We're gonna be talking as well about the reality of their lives. What was it like to be in a kitchen, literally and figuratively bound to that fire? And lastly, we're gonna to touch on their legacy. What is their legacy up until most recently? I think we all know that in 2020, um, you know, icons like Aunt Jemima were retired from our grocery shelves. So what does this legacy look like and where are we going from here? So I start with this image because I feel like it really hits that myth home. And I think if any of you have been to most plantation museums um, throughout the country, I think a lot of plantation museums are doing wonderful work. A lot of them, however, still stick to this narrative of white ladies dressed in these beautiful dresses, doing all the cooking. And maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you'll hear a story about the enslaved assistants or whomever that were there helping the lady of the house make all the food. And my work really pushes against this, and I'm not saying that there weren't white women cooking in kitchens, but the work that I, the focus of my research was to look at these larger plantation homes, ones that had distinct enslaved chefs, cooks, assistants, etc., a building dedicated to this culinary art, in which case there were no white women in those spaces. And that's something that I feel we're still struggling with in public history is getting that narrative uh, straight. So this myth um, manifested in multiple ways. I think one of the most powerful propaganda campaigns in American history is that of what you see here. What you're looking at here is broadly referred to as Black Americana. It is was a propaganda campaign and it was full of and it continues in some ways to be full of racist pop propaganda, iconography, and it was born out of the period in the middle of the 18th century, 19th century, excuse me, um, when the abolition, uh, abolitionist movement was really moving forward and you had minstrel shows as the most popular form of entertainment in the United States. And during that period, you had this argument happening, of course, between Southern plantation owners and abolitionists going back and forth, trying to figure out who was right, who was wrong. You know, were enslaved folks like the South wanted you to believe these loyal, happy slaves that wanted nothing more than to be in the service of their enslaver? Or were they people who actually wanted to be liberated? And so as part of that conversation that was happening for decades, you have this kind of rhetoric coming out of the happy house slave. And I think you see this sort of iconography manifest in things like Aunt Jemima, which I said, um, you know, she has recently retired. She's off the shelves as well as Uncle Ben and other icons that have similar historical roots. So these kinds of objects, and you see here on the top right, this is also part of Black Americana. And I know a lot of people have this stuff in their collection. I've been giving this lecture now for about 15 years. And I tell you, almost every time I give this talk, someone ends up sending me 
some sort of little racist, you know, tidbit from their grandma's house or from their own house that they don't want to show anymore. And they don't want it in their house because they know it's embarrassing. But you can find this stuff all over eBay. It's a very popular thing that people collect. Um, and it really, all of these things together, really manifest the idea that African Americans were happy in their place of servitude to white people. So even everything to this sort of mid 20th century ad right here about how Aunt Jemima makes another couple happy. So this was very much tethered to that idea of the happy black loyal slave, excuse me, and this was all coming out as well um, during a period when African Americans were really struggling with trying to find equality during the period of Jim Crow. So this was a very intentional way of subversively in some ways and very outwardly sort of aggressively in others, um, putting people in their place. And this is something that we all started talking about in 2020. And that is why, again, um, people like Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima are now retired. What's really fascinating about this whole cultural movement of this black Americana, it was really dominant for about a hundred plus years. And what's wild to me is that there's this overabundance of this iconography of black chefs, right? You see, this is a, you know, cream of wheat racist, right? He is clearly cooking the food and he's got his little sign up. You have Aunt Jemima, you have Uncle Ben, et cetera, but you have a, an absolute lack of actual credit to these people for creating American cuisine. So that that's one of the things that right now is, is sort of starting to dissolve, which I'm very happy about. And it's really starting to break down because of the work like Michael Twitty and others have been doing for decades. So we're gonna rewind way back because again, my PhD is in African diaspora studies. I feel like the history of African-Americans need to start um, before they were enslaved on the continent of West Africa and start talking about how the transatlantic slave trade, how the hundreds of years of enslavement um, affected the culinary cuisine, but you have to go back to the root of that. So cooking traditions in the parts of West Africa where a lot of the enslaved folks were brought um, from um, included things like one pot meals. So there was incredible diversity in these spaces. You would have um, everything from rice dishes to one pot stews, and we'll be talking about those in a little bit. But the diversity among the, the West Africans who were forced to then get on the slave ships and be brought over and cook sometimes in these kitchens excuse me, some of them had vastly different dietary needs. A significant portion of the enslaved folks throughout the uh, Eastern coast and Southern United States or before the Southern British uh, North America, you would have had about 30% on some plantations who were actually Muslim. And so being forced to eat things like pork, um, being forced to drink for, um, you know, out of lack of anything else to excuse me, um, quench your thirst was something that was incredibly challenging for some of these groups as well. So incredibly um, diverse groups. And one of the things too, that's really important to acknowledge when you're thinking about the survival and the beauty and the, the uh, perseverance of West African foodways within the diaspora is that a lot of these original groups of people were, you know, at war with one another. And so they were having to then make friends and instant family out of people who might not have spoken the same language or cooked the same food or had the same feelings about each other, etc. But what happened in places like Virginia and, and British North America and other parts of the African diaspora is these communities developed and they found ways where their cultures overlapped. And that's where you start seeing the culinary roots of a lot of what we see in Southern foodways today. So the African diaspora really quickly um, lasted between approximately 1501 and the end of the 1880s, where over 12.5 million in, uh, captured and enslaved Africans were forced across the Atlantic. That is a very conservative estimate of the, the number of people that actually came. That is only what was written in books. And that does not include those who died on voyage or, <clears throat> excuse me, or any of their descendants once they came to the colonies in the Western hemisphere. And one of the things that's really important about sort of understanding what this all means and why I'm bringing it out is only 4% of those 12.5 million ended up in British North America. So when you think about the ways in which recipes and food and traditions were passed down through generations, made it across in the minds of these folks across the Middle Passage, when you only have 4% of that larger 
um, group coming across to a certain very large area, it's going to be slightly diluted. So all that means is that you have to look a little tiny bit closer. So if, for instance, if you go somewhere like Brazil right now, you would see very West African dishes being cooked the same exact way they were probably cooked hundreds of years ago because so many of the enslaved folks ended up in Brazil. In British North America, and especially as you go up north a little bit, it's just worn down over time and it's a little bit more subtle. So these enslaved folks would end up places like Stratford Hall. This is where I work um, on the right side here. And I always point this out first because my favorite building on the site is the original 1738 kitchen. Um, Stratford Hall was established in 1738 and it was built this, this stunning mansion that is one of the most famous Georgian mansions in the United States was built by enslaved African labor. And their stories now are completely saturated within our historical narrative. And we're very proud of the work that we're doing at Stratford. And we're gonna talk about this particular space and that particular kitchen in a little while. Um, but what I, what I wanna sort of get you thinking about is that division between the folks working in the field versus the fo folks working in the house. And that's something that I think is really important. So we're gonna jump right into um, thinking about the field quarters. These are places that would have been far away from the main house. They would have had quarter yards. And what you see here um, is an example of a 19th century cabin, a one bedroom cabin. Sometimes they would have duplexes, sometimes they'd be more dorm-like and they'd be set up in sort of little villages and um, little areas with these communal gardens right here. And those gardens were set up on purpose, um, one out of necessity. So the rations that were given to these enslaved folks um, weekly by the overseer might have been a little bit of fat back, which is pretty much the fat part of the bacon, and perhaps a little bit of cornmeal. If you were in the, the, um, the <clears throat> sort of rice area, the sea islands, you might get some rice. And so depending on the geography, you would get a little bit of whatever was grown in the area. And that was all you were given. And so these West African people were then really sort of forced to be as creative as possible. And so what they did is they would grow um, their vegetables and some sub supplementary food in these little garden plots. And this was sort of a, a two-sided or a, or a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, they were able to then sort of like uh, in some cases, they were able to create a sort of garden of peppers and okra and things that they would like to eat. But on the other hand, um, it was still work that they had to do on top of working from sunup to sundown for the people who enslaved them. So it's it was a tactical move on the behalf of the enslaver to make sure that they had to supplement their food, one, to save money, and two, to keep them busy to make to doing something that they had to do to keep them from running away. One of the things you also see in these plantations, especially for folks working in the field, is they would then also have to go out and hunt. They would have to set up if you're near water, um, you know, sort of fish traps, etc. And they were constantly trying to bring food from across the site into this area to be able to feed their families in one pot meals. These right here are what are called kitchen yards. That is a phrase uh, coined by Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste out of UMass, um, excuse me, where is she? She is at Amherst um, and she is phenomenal. She's a friend of mine. She is an African-American archeologist and she does really wonderful work um, with architectural sort of landscape studies, et cetera. And what you started to see in these plantation complexes are these areas where enslaved folks would all come together communally on Sundays if they weren't working after their sun up to sundown. And this is where the community, be this is where the community was created. And this is where the community really strengthened the bonds between these folks that were going through so much on those plantations. This is also the spaces where those recipes were talked about, remembered and passed down through generations. So if you ended up having to be enslaved in the big house um, or the mansion and you lived in and around the domestic quarters, your life was a little bit different. You were always under the watchful eye of the enslaver. You really never had a break. Um, the reason I named the book Bound to the Fire is because these chefs literally sometimes were cooking these massive meals and they couldn't leave the hearth behind because it was, you know, there was a million, there were a million dishes cooking um, there for the people who um, owned the plantation and all of their guests. So right here, excuse me, you see this kitchen again. This is where a man named Caesar resided during the 18th century. And he is somebody that we have spent 
lots of dedication on and telling his story. And if you go on to Stratford Hall's YouTube channel, we've got a plethora of cooking demonstrations um, by a man named Don Tavius Williams, who interprets him on the site and really goes into his life at Stratford Hall. So these kitchens are really important and really essential in thinking about the food that was produced for people like George Washington, for Thomas Jefferson, for the Lees of Virginia, which is where, what Stratford is, and the ways in which that kitchen produced food that was eaten by some of the most important people in the world during the 18th century. So normally, if this was in person, I would say, you know, someone tell me what these things stand for, but we're on Zoom, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I am sure half of you are like, oh, pineapples, it's hospitality. The other half might say, why are you showing me pineapples that are, you know, pretty much just sort of gilded and, and supposed to be on, you know, like bookends. Anyways, these are an important symbol, especially throughout the southern United States, because people who were heavily invested in the slave trade, like the Lees, um, like others, they would have had... Um, um, a lot of currency in, in the trade. They were able to then have ships come up. I mean, the Lees were known for having their Madeira literally leave the island of Madeira, the islands, and go down to the equator to get that just perfect toast, then hit the tropics and come back up to the Potomac and drop off food. So oftentimes, people who were wealthy and had those kinds of connections would end up with a pineapple in their shipment of goods. Pineapples, as you can imagine, um, wouldn't have lasted long on a ship. And so if you ended up with the pineapple after it made its way up for weeks and weeks and sometimes months that they were making lots of stops up to the Potomac from the Caribbean, you would have had one of the most rare and sort of exotic pieces of fruit or food you can ever imagine. And so if you would share this with your guests, that was the ultimate symbol of hosp hospitality. And that is why you literally see these things carved into buildings, um, you know, in all kinds of architectural details throughout a lot of the uh, British, you know, North America. One of the things as well, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really important and funny, I think, to share with you all, and I think those of you that are interested in material culture and food are going to find this very funny as well, but the other really rare food item during the 18th century was celery. But I don't think it was as attractive to put celery on architectural fixings. But at the same time, um, they actually had a movement where there was all these celery vases for the table. So we actually have a celery vase. I should probably get a slide of that for my next talk. We have a celery vase with fake celery in it at Stratford because that was equally as desired and exotic um, during the 18th century. So I want to think, um, I want you all to think for a moment about the role of food in these plantation um, communities. Um, for the, the white folks, food was a way to show off their wealth. This is how they made sure that they all married each other, that the elite sort of pedigree was going to keep, be kept at a certain level. And of course, you know, everything from these balls that Virginians used to have, there's a, an image here of, of folks doing the Virginia reel, which weirdly enough, I was taught in Berkeley, California, where I grew up, which I don't understand how on earth that made it out to California. But, you know, these kinds of gatherings were incredibly important for these colonial Americans and these, um, and these, <clears throat> excuse me, these new Americans during the federal period as well to really sort of uh, define who they were as a nation. You know, who are these people? Who are we? Uh, what are we eating? And making sure that their families maintained a certain kind of connection with one another. So I'm going to now switch and pivot and talk a little bit about some of the architectural um, sort of elements of homes and the ways in which sort of those myths have really um, permeated public history tours and our, our ideas about space on these kinds of plantations. If you all were mostly in the South right now, I would ask some more questions because most folks who live in the South have been to at least one plantation museum. But what you find when you go to these plantation museums, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as you start seeing these myths really being pushed out as part of the narrative. And I'm gonna tell you why that's problematic and I'm gonna break them down as well. So there's two moments in American history, <clears throat> according to my research and others as well, where there's significant changes happening to the built environment. One of them is you see the start of these um, exterior kitchens being built outside of the main house. And if you go on a plantation tour, typically, 
um, unless you go to one of the sites that are a little bit more forward thinking in terms of their research and have, have caught up with some things, you're going to hear some stories about how the kitchens were moved outside because of fire. That comes from this 1705 <clears throat> quote from, uh, excuse me, and it says, all the drudgeries of cookery, washing, dairies, etc., are performed in offices detached from their dwelling house, houses, which by this means are kept more cool and sweet. So we get this wonderful quote from 1705. It becomes law. And this turns into um, this sort of narrative that all these kitchens were being moved outside during that period because of <clears throat> what smell and fire, right? So there's two issues with this. One is that um, there's just the very simple fact that during this period of 1705, these kitchens started to pop up outside of the main house. And what you see happening with the demographics of places like Virginia is you start seeing a huge rise in, in white women coming and settling and these colonial homes are popping up everywhere. And they're sort of creating these little spaces of the new colony where there's a, you know, a man of the house and his wife and their children. You also see a decline in indentured laborers and an incredibly high spike and enslaved Africans being brought in to do the kind of work that would be happening in these kitchens. So what you see here is you see these larger plantations moving the kitchen outside for a couple of reasons. One, and it's not because of fire danger necessarily, and I would say not because of smell, I'll talk about that in a minute, but you start seeing the landscape respond to ideas about race. This is also in the period where a lot of the old African-American, the black codes, as they would call them, were being put into place where they were really formalizing into law the differences between um, you know, black people and white people and what that meant in space and law and in action. And one of the things that makes me laugh about this quote and this sort of love of it is that you think about the fires, right? I'll talk about that in a moment. The fires was an issue as well as the smells. Now, I laugh at that because colonial folks were not bathing that much. And so I think about the idea of a roasted pheasant and a beet stew and all the things that Caesar would have been cooking in that kitchen and how amazing that would have smelled. And then I think about what it would smell like walking through a house that didn't have food cooking and all you would smell was your husband's feet. And so for me, that one doesn't really stand up. But most importantly, I would also say that at Stratford Hall alone, there are 16 fireplaces and eight chimneys. And these would have been going all the time during the cold months. So the fire thing gets thrown out the window. You also would have had an enslaved chef there minding that fire 24 seven bound to that fire. So all of these things sort of push back a little bit on that storyline. One of the other ways that you see, excuse me, the built environment change excuse me, um, because of food and because of race, is you see this period right around the Revolutionary War up until the early 1800s, um, about 18 teens or so, right after the transatlantic slave trade closes. And there's a lot of conversation during those, those two periods about, excuse me, about abolition. Um, when the, the nation was born, of course, you have, you know, Patrick Henry's famous quote, give me liberty or give me death. You've also got a significant number of, of rebellions and slave revolts happening, happening not only on ships, but on plantations. And of course, we saw what happened in Haiti. Um, so those kinds of things that were happening were discussed in these dining rooms of people that were very important. And so when you think about sort of what that means to the security, if you were one of the enslavers, is you want to be able to flex the use of the space. And so things like right here, a dumbwaiter, Think about that for one minute. I have said that word so many times my whole life. But if you think about what a dumb waiter is, it's the ability, and Jefferson brought these over from France, it's the ability to replace a human being who would have been enslaved standing there listening to your conversation with a piece of furniture where you could stack the courses up and change them out as need be. Then you are able to freely talk about slave revolts, the idea of freedom, what's happening, etc. The other thing that you see as well are these underground passageways and you see them built on top of the ground sometimes, which is a beautiful Palladian nod and I get that, but there's also a function to that. So when you have 
you know, sort of connective architecture, connecting the outside kitchen to the main house, or you go as far as some places did like Monticello and Berkeley Plantation, which is where this sign used to um, sit on the bottom right, they're underground. So when you start hearing people say, look, that was just an architectural element, it had nothing to do with race, you have to remind them that those things started popping up and being added during this very, very turbulent time in the period of racial conversations in this nation. And also the ones underground have absolutely nothing to do with architectural design. So it is pretty fascinating. So let's jump right in and start talking about the cooks, the chefs, um, the people that were actually bound to the fire and having to cook all of those meals for these very important Virginians um, and early Americans. So I wanna take you into the kitchen. This is our hearth. It's the original 1738 hearth. Excuse the plaster, it will be getting fixed very soon. Um, this is Dontavius Williams on the right here. And on the left, you have a man named Mr. Payne whose father was born enslaved at Stratford Hall. And Mr. Payne here worked at Stratford until he passed. Um, and he actually has uh, a burial plot there, a different story, different lecture, but his family members are still very much involved with Stratford Hall. And there's been a lot of memorialization around his role um, in the kitchen as well as on the site itself. But the hours in these spaces were brutal. So, you know, thinking about the amount of food they would have had to cook, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, they would have had to cook sometimes literally 24 hours a day. There are some recipes that I read that were, I mean, absolutely time consuming. And you have to make sure, you know, the fire doesn't get out of control. And so the hours were long. The fire was hot. I tell you, having cooked in this kitchen with Dontavius, and that when that fire is going, that you see that that, that hearth, when there are fires going in there, it is way over 100 degrees. You add that to the disgustingly humid summers in Virginia, and it's an incredibly uncomfortable space to be in. So we try to schedule Dontavius in cold months to come do his programs. There are certain things that are date bound that we keep on the schedule, but it is incredibly hard to be fires are going. And then one of the things that I learned as well through my research is that enslaved chefs died from burns um, more than anybody else. Because one of the things that I learned about through actually talking about um, talking to, through oral history of descendants of those who were enslaved told me that they heard from their great, 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 right, that they had to stick their arm in the bread oven to make sure it was hot enough to make the food, the, the bread every day. And if it burned a little bit, it was ready to go. So you multiply that by bread multiple times a week, and that's a lot of burns. And so sort of that's something to keep very forward in your mind. And of course the bell system, right? So I always bring up Downton Abbey because I feel like most people can sort of resonate with that. But there was a bell system at a lot of these homes. Stratford Hall had one as well. And that meant because of Virginia hospitality, because of Southern hospitality, that meant if someone shows up at your doorstep at four in the morning, the bell is rung and someone like Caesar would have to get up and make sure that person had everything they needed in terms of food. And that kind of tradition, while not the same as it was there, is still very much um, wed to Southern history and culture now. Um, the last thing I wanna mention also is the trauma in these spaces. So again, it's like, we're gonna talk about food, we're talking about the labor, we're talking about all of this holistically, but there's also a lot of, there was a lot of fear as well among the enslaved chefs, and there's records that I, I found and that are in my book talking about some of the horrible violence that occurred in these spaces because a biscuit was burned. So you think about the context of slavery and the need that these white folks had for a certain kind of caliber of food, but also the total power in so many ways they had to control and then threaten those who worked in that space. So it's, it was a very, very hard position to be in. They had to cook incredible feasts. Again, I'm talking about these larger plantations, not the smaller farms or, or a plantation that only had a couple of people who were enslaved and they did all sorts of things. I'm talking about ones that were entertaining, um, ones that would have put American cuisine on the map in an international way. So places like Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, places like George Washington's Mount Vernon, places like Stratford Hall, um, where, which was the home of the Lees, they would have very often um, had these massive, massive afternoon um, dinners where they would have had a three course meal. And this is an example of some of the things that would have been served, which means 
Caesar would have had to cook it. So you look over here on the left, you've got a leg of lamb, you've got a, you know, um, mutton, you've got fish, you've got sweetbreads, you've got some soups, and all of this was served the first course. Now, of course, the people at the table would not have eaten all of this food, but it was very much about showing off not just your wealth, but your sophistication, as well as the skills of your enslaved chef. The second course, because you didn't have enough during that first course, would have been all the things that you see here in the middle. So multiple kinds of pies, roasted meats, roasted vegetables, jellies, you name it would have been served. And thinking about all of these things from the perspective of someone who used to be a chef, when I went and read through dozens of cookbooks written by these white ladies back in the 18, you know, 18th century, 19th century, you start um, realizing with your chef eyes, how much work went into this, you know, it's like if you're planning Thanksgiving dinner, and you're like, hold on, you know, we're not going to make all 20 things from scratch, like where can we cut the corner? There was no option for that back then. So when you look at those kinds of recipes and you think about it in a labor perspective, you start to really be able to carve out this sort of narrative of what their skill level was and how much work actually went into feeding the people in the big house. And of course the dessert course, you can't miss that. And you've got this over here, combination, of course, of anything to do with sugar, sugar, and I have a whole Audible uh, book on this as well, if you want to look that up. But the history of sugar is fascinating and absolutely related to um, slavery during the colonial era. And, you know, sweets were something that only the rich could afford, and they would have been in abundance like you see here. Now let's talk about some of the things that are on that table um, that did not come from Europe. And this is a really important thing to focus on. And this is when earlier when I said there's, you know, 4% of the enslaved folks ended up in places like Virginia, New York, et cetera, you gotta look a little bit closer, but once you see it, um, it's really hard to unsee. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so you've got these things right here in the top left. If you're close to the water, they would have been cooking oyster stew. Now, I love this about oyster stew. It is in every single cookbook I've read. And um, what I think is really cool about it is it is definitely um, a European dish. It comes from Ireland or England. They ate it there in abundance, but they also ate and continue to eat oyster stew throughout many parts of West Africa and especially in the Gambia, where a lot of the enslaved folks came from that ended up at Stratford and a lot of other places throughout the diaspora. It's a different you know, flavor palette with a different um, spice profile, but oyster stew was something that was eaten in both areas and very much then um, became part of Southern or East Coast cuisine, if you will. You also see something like a tomato and okra stew. This was something that was in, again, Mary Randolph's cookbook. It was in a bunch of the recipe books that you see. And okra and okra tomato stew and any kind of okra stew generally is something also that you would have found um, in most of West Africa and is still, you know, cooked throughout today. You've got gumbo, same thing. That is literally the Yoruba word for okra. And that is something that is so synonymous with places like New Orleans that you just think of that as that Southern cuisine. That is a straight up unadulterated West African recipe. And also ground nut stew. There was a period I don't know, 20 years ago or so in Virginia, where you would still get peanut stew everywhere, every little corner, you know, gas station restaurant would have it. That's gone away, unfortunately, maybe it'll come back. But groundnut stew, peanut stew, is something that was so uh, synonymous with Virginia cuisine. I mean, Virginia peanuts, right? Those all came from West Africa and came, the recipes came in the minds of those who were enslaved cooked in the quarter and then recreated in those big house kitchens. And then of course, Jambalaya is a direct descendant of jollof rice, which is also seen throughout most of West Africa. So you ha have all of these, you know, sort of very West African dishes being cooked and then literally being written into American cuisine, into those cookbooks. And I guarantee that, you know, the 18th century cookbooks are slim. Um, you don't see a ton of references to this in the earlier ones. By the time the 19th century rolls around, most cookbooks in the Southern United States have recipes for West African dishes written by white ladies in there because they're cooks, they're chefs were cooking that food and they loved it so much they wanted to write it down. So something to think about. Another thing that's really important that you can't really break away from is that the food and the cuisine of these chefs 
was very much part of the birth of this nation. Um, I love this picture. It's a bunch of white dudes with wigs. And it's important to sort of think about the conversations that were happening in these all male spaces. They were sipping on rum made in the Caribbean, a West African recipe from Barbados in the 1640s. They were drinking uh, brandies that were made on site. They were smoking tobacco. They were drinking Madeira, which I talked about earlier. And they were literally and figuratively eating the fruits of enslaved labor. And so when you think about the role of food, not just in having your daughter married off, but in having these conversations that literally helped people be brave enough to then fight for independence is something worth noting. Oh, this is fun. Okay, so I talked earlier about, I don't know why I get so excited about this, but I'm hoping some of you are getting equally as excited. So one of the things I talked about earlier is the, the pressure that these enslaved folks had to cook a certain caliber of food, which they were completely capable of doing. But one of the things that they also had is what I call soft power. They had the absolute power to kill their enslavers dead. Because a lot of the folks that came from West Africa and ended up in these kitchens um, originally were healers in West Africa. They were root doctors. They were people that sometimes acted as midwives as well in these large plantation homes. And they had every kind of tonic and, and medicine and uh, all coming from plants, easily grown in their little garden. Um, they could have very easily killed the people who enslaved them. And there are cases of this in which are in my book as well. Um, a lot of times as well, people died, the enslavers died without being poisoned, but it looked like poisoning. It's because there was no germ theory back then. And people were also just not refrigerating their food and getting sick. So the power to poison was something that you see show up um, in court records, obviously, but you also see it in moments like, like after Nat Turner's rebellion in, in 1831, there are so many letters from white ladies in Virginia basically saying, look, I gave the cook the week off. I'm not eating the food. I'm going to get killed dead. So thinking about that kind of negotiation, how those enslaved chefs navigated that power is something that I think we need to really think about. We think about their agency and what they were actually doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But also the back of every cookbook that I read was all of, it was all the medicine and the tonics and the difference between a sip of a tonic and a whole bottle of tonic is the same thing between two Tylenol and a whole bottle. So it's an important thing to think about. One of the, the myths that I actually, I think I forgot to mention in the beginning, but I think is really important and really sort of pushes back against these sort of the idea that they were happy, loyal slaves is that they were disconnected to the folks in the field, that the closer they got, the enslaved folks got to the big house, the more and more whitewashed they, they came, right? So terms like Uncle Tom, um, you know, Auntie so-and-so, those kinds of, 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 um, of, of, of sort of, I'm sorry, I'm, like, I'm getting all excited, so I'm talking really fast. Those kinds of um, people in American thought, right, are representing this sort of loyal, um, very like culturally disconnected from their roots, black folks on these plantations. And something that I, I got very excited about, and this is when I put my archeology span hat on in my research, is that I found incredible evidence of root work and conjuring happening in these kitchen spaces by the cooks themselves. So this pushes back against that whole idea that one, they were happy, that two, they were disconnected to the folks in the field because there's also evidence of folks in the field coming up for consultation of one sort or another in those kitchen spaces. Right here is an image of what's called the Bakongo Cosmogram. It manifests itself in many ways and objects throughout the African diaspora, but what you see here is a symbol that represents the, um, the, the sort of circle of life. So you've got, and water separates the two of them. So you have the ancestral world and the living world, you have birth and you have death. And by making this X on objects, <clears throat> excuse me, by making this X on objects, um, they believe that they were conjuring their ancestors, the spirits for protection and other things um, as a way of using traditional West African um, sort of magic, if you will, or religious beliefs. So what's important about that is when you, when you look at the archeological records, which I did, and I went and assessed a bunch of collections and I'm continuing to do that now at Stratford and keep your eyes out and if, few months, there's going to be an article published. There's some pretty incredible stuff that we found. But what we started to find when we started looking through this is that the, there were bundles of objects 
placed, I'll go back over here. So if the idea is that this is the, the piercing of the, the world between life and death, the spiritual world and the answer and the living world. Um, and this, anything in the North, if this was a map right here, the North uh, West or the North East quadrant, if you look down, oops, if you look down at a, a room or a house from the top, what we're starting to see and archaeologists have been finding now for a while is that in the kitchen house, or in slave quarters, or sometimes like at Stratford in the big house, these enslaved folks would put crystals, they would put um, all kinds of objects in that northeast or northwest, excuse me, um, quadrant to conjure, conjure spirits into that space. So it's an incredible pushback to the idea that somehow, you know, the closer they got to the, the big house, they became more loyal. They were just subversive actors in that space. And they were absolutely using their agency to push back as many ways as they possibly could. This image right here, and I'll wrap it up here pretty soon. This image right here is something that I ran across after I wrote my dissertation, which became my book, but it's called The Dancer Ball. It's a, uh, White Sulphur Springs, Virginia, 1838. And it's this image at White Sulphur, Sulphur Springs, which was kind of, sort of like a resort space, but they had enslaved chefs there. And what you see here in this image is some sort of wedding happening or a dance or a ball. And it really reflected a lot of what I found out in the diaries of a lot of the, the <clears throat> excuse me, enslavers that they talked about these gatherings in the kitchen. And so there's even evidence on some plantations that they would have weddings for the enslaved folks, like the reception would be in the kitchen space. So these kitchens are incredibly dynamic spaces. They are places, places of, of pain. They are places of pride, creativity, love, family, all together. And it's important to sort of understand the space where that food was created, where these communities were created, where the struggle happened as these multifaceted dynamic spaces on these plantations. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of chefs that I pulled out of my work uh, before I wrap it up and open it up for questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. This right here um, is a book by my dear friend, Ramin Ganeshram. It is a novel, but it is about Chef Hercules, who was George Washington's chef. The image up there, unfortunately, is not Chef Hercules. Google it. It's kind of sad because I think we were all excited that there was this image of him. It's not, but it works for the use of this. So Chef Hercules was born in 1754. I consider him, as others do, the first celebrity chef in America because he was George Washington's chef. And I'll tell you why he was a celebrity in a moment. He was born in 1754. He married a woman named Alice um, at Mount Vernon. She passed away. He had been working in and around the house at Mount Vernon and he got pulled into the kitchen to work with an enslaved man named Nat at around 1786 and he was 32 years old. He and Alice before she passed had three children, Richmond, Evie and Delia. And in late 1790, <clears throat> excuse me, he was tapped to come up with George Washington and others um, to be the president chef. So he went up there, he learned how to cook a certain way, um, and then ended up being a very, very famous man in that space. So I want you to think about that for a moment and what it would have been like to be the first American president, a chef, and who he would have met. Uh, Philadelphia had one of the largest free Black communities. He would have been going to market. He would have had connections from dinner guests that he would have met while he was introduced. He was very, very central to that space and the fame of George Washington at the time. Um, I'm going to rewind back a little bit because in the 1780s, Pennsylvania passed what was called the Gradual Emancipation Act. And that meant that anyone who held enslaved folks in their household in the state of Pennsylvania would have to free them after six months, whether they brought them with them or whether when this act went into place immediately after six months, they would have been free. George Washington did not know about this. George Washington went up to Philadelphia, brought a fair amount of enslaved folks, including people like Oni Judge, into Philadelphia thinking that everything was going to be fine and then found out abruptly that there was this law that was passed. So he writes back and forth to some folks. He's trying to figure out what to do. And he decides that instead of just freeing them or maybe hiring some folks to do the food, he decided that he was going to 
sneak them back and not tell them to touch the soil of Virginia every five months and few days. That way they kept them, that, that would keep them enslaved. I guarantee that Chef Hercules figured this out pretty quickly. And what I, I think is incredibly important about this is in every single one of those trips over the five year period, he would have met people on every kind of route you can imagine. So think about that for a minute. So fast forward, it's 1796. Washington is closing his, his tenure up at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before I even get into that, rewind back a little bit more, the celebrity part of him. This is too cool to miss. Uh, he has this wonderful description um, done by George Washington's step-grandson of him running his kitchen, kind of like Gordon Ramsay, right? Like, I mean, just to the nines, like everything was perfect, you know, like a military sergeant, you know, ready to go on time, beautifully done. Then he would dress up in the most amazing livery you can imagine. I'm talking silk stockings, a velvet jacket, a big hat. He had a, a cane and a gold watch. And he would walk down Market Street in Philadelphia and white men would bow to him. So you think about what that did to a man who was once enslaved on a plantation doing odd tasks, made his way up to being the first celebrity chef in Philadelphia and the United States, to then have to go back and be enslaved every six months. So fast forward, 1796, they found out, um, or we found out, and you have to read her book, she did incredible research on this, but in 1796, he was listed as shoveling manure back at Mount Vernon, which had to have been the most devastating demotion of someone's life. But my favorite part of this is in 1797, on George Washington's birthday, George Washington wakes up and Chef Hercules had escaped. For the rest of his story by Ramin's wonderful book, and you will find out what happened to him afterwards. And then quickly, I wanna talk about the chef who was on the cover of my book. Um, she was penned by a man named David Hunter Strother in 1855. She is from Amherst County, Virginia. And she was bragged about in his missive in this magazine for Harper's Weekly Bazaar about how she basically had everything you can imagine at her fingertips. She had the skills of, you know, of the best chef you could have imagined. She had her, you know, her children had her first dip in gravies and eating the best, the breasts of fried chicken, um, but she was enslaved. And so talking about this woman who he didn't name, unfortunately, in that kind of respectful way um, is something that I think is worth, is worth noting. And so I picked her for the cover of my book because I wanted to give a nod to the thousands of enslaved women and men um, who are not in the records, whose names did not survive, but whose work and whose pride and whose labor literally helped create American cuisine. And on the right here, we have um, three of the wonderful interpreters that we have regularly at Stratford, Nicole Moore, Dontavious Williams, and the famous Cheney McKnight. And I will end my talk with this image right here. It is an art installation from 1972 by Betty Saar, an African-American artist, and it is called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. And I end with this because you see this very racialized, racist, Black Americana-esque mammy figure, but it's been recalibrated um, by this woman, Betty Saar, by giving her a broom, but also a shotgun in her other hand. And this came out, of course, during the period of the Black Panther movement. You've got Black cultural you know, movements happening. And it's the beginning of this recalibration of who she was, who she stands for, and how we should remember her and everyone like her who had to labor in those kitchens. So I'm going to end my talk now by saying that I hope this work um, finds resonance with people. I hope it broadens the story and gives credit and respect to those who had to labor in these kitchens. Okay, now I'm done talking. I tried to get it in there under 45 minutes. <laughs> well, this was wonderful and fascinating. Um, Thank you. It's so appreciated. And we are uh, asking um, folks to put the questions in chat. I uh, can uh, address uh, the, them to the uh, Ann Arbor District Library, and then we'll we'll pass them on to Kelly. We have, you know, obviously we've got time um, for uh, some questions at least. So we have one question. Uh, has the Bakongo Cosmogram been found to appear on physical objects or was its use limited to locating conjures in the Northwest quadrant of rooms? I'm thinking of David Drake's possible use of it on storage jars, but his pottery was limited to the Carolinas and Georgia. 
Yeah, let me um, hold on here. Okay, I will show you. You all have to check out. There's actually a couple lectures on YouTube about this. This is the crystal. You can see it. Hold on, let me unblur my background. So forgive my my funky background here. Give me one second. <laughs> okay, maybe you can see this right here. That crystal. Yes. It's about this big, and it was found put into the, the northeast quadrant of the house by the enslaved Africans who built Stratford Hall. So incredible. And yeah, we do find these things. And that's my dog squeaking. So I apologize if you hear him playing with his toy. But yeah, we do find that Mount Vernon, or not Mount Vernon, uh, Montpelier found one a few years ago in the slave quarter. And they actually had the descendants when they rebuilt the slave quarter, put it back in the same place. So if you look this up, you're going to see those X's on all kinds of things, on crystals, on spoons. I give archaeology lectures where you see on the bottom of pots. I mean, it was put into everything because, you know, it's what you do. You're scared. So you're going to put that in there and you're going to make sure you're protected. So it's an incredible insight into what was happening in those spaces. Uh, Nancy writes, thank you for this wonderful lecture, Kelly. Your book is such an important contribution to the field. Can you tell us what culinary programs you're planning for Stratford Hall? Yes. So we actually just filmed, we did, a, we get money from Mars Chocolate, which is phenomenal because Caesar was one of the earliest chocolate makers in Colonial Virginia, the chef at Stratford. So we get money from Mars. We've got a, a fair amount of chocolate programs, which you can find. We just did one in December that just came out. But while we did that, we had celebrity chef, Chris Scott, who was on Top Chef season 15, I think. And he's done some, a bunch of TV stuff on, on the Food Network. He is now a friend of Stratford and he came down and they he and Dontavius filmed a barbecue episode and I can't even begin to tell you I will send you all the link when we schedule that it's probably going to be in May when we it'll be on zoom so zoom right in and chef Scott will be on zoom and Dontavius will be on zoom and we're going to show the video that we shot like a 20 minute cooking demonstration and then talk about the history of barbecue and the role of African-American men in barbecue traditions. And I cannot wait for that. Um, and I'm also, it's, it's funny you ask. So I'm literally scheduling out our next year's uh, food programs and other programs. So there's going to be a lot. So please keep, you know, just keep Stratford on your radar, follow us and you'll find out all the stuff we've got coming up. Great. Um, yes, we actually had uh, uh, Adrian Miller, who talked, uh, author of Black Smoke, uh, mm -hmm. as one of our very earliest Zoom speakers. He was yeah, I know Adrian really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was he, lovely and gracious. <laughs> yeah, he made us all really hungry. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, Mary Lou writes, how would Native American food and cooking have informed early recipes? Wonderful, wonderful question. So barbecue is one of those things. So you've got the tradition of smoking meats that you see um, amongst, amongst indigenous communities, but you also have similar like flavor profiles and dry rubs and cooking techniques that came over from West Africa. So it's a really cool combination. And one of the things that I talk about as well, when you think about colonial food, is that you have indigenous ingredients, you know, things like cornbread are so synonymous with Southern food, with soul food, you wouldn't have cornbread without Native American corn, right? So there's a bunch of ways too, ingredient wise, um, how those things came together. Mm. Uh, Sully, uh, Lurie writes, Sully Plantation in Virginia explained, the slaves had to whistle while carrying the food to the main house to prevent them from eating the food, hence the name whistle walk. <sighs> so it's funny, I actually, I skipped the description of that slide because I felt like I was getting too excited and I was going to go over my 45 minutes, but I had that slide um, in the built environment. Mm -hmm. That is one of those myths. So if you can imagine any, I mean, it just, just think about it for one second, right? The cooks are in there tasting the food, sometimes being forced to taste the food so they know that it's not poison. They're in there elbows deep in the biscuit making and all that stuff. And somehow they don't trust them to eat the food as they came in. I think the whistling bit um, has some validation when you think about maybe knowing when they're coming because they're having those kinds of conversations. But in terms of not eating the food, that is actually a Jim Crow era narrative that was very much baked into the idea of that ritual because who wants to talk about, you know, the hypocrisy of, of freedom during the revolution and slavery um, when you can make up a story about not eating the food. <laughs> These plantation sites, I need to go visit Sully. I haven't been, that's also a Lee family site. So I think I'm overdue for that one. 
thank you for that. I didn't know that narrative was there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I seeing the question made me think I had heard that that was a myth as well. Um, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, so any cookbooks actually written by slaves or recipes in uh, cookbooks were written by um, white women, more likely women than men writing cookbooks, where they were acknowledging the, the work of the slaves? Um, not that I've found. I mean, I think their acknowledgement is when you read the recipes and it's like, you don't know how to make gumbo. <laughs> Why are you writing that down? So, you know, I think they weren't thinking about that with those, you know, I have not seen any reference to that. If I, if I run across an old handwritten cookbook, I'll be pretty excited. I have not found either a cookbook written by an enslaved person. Um, but you know, there's still time to do more research and to see what I can uncover. I'm going to be working on a second book pretty soon and it's going to be more recipe focused. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to have to go visit those cookbooks again and open them up. I'm um, not seeing any more questions. Jackie, have you have you got any others that have come in? None others that have come in just yet. Okay, great. Uh, well, in that case, I think we can uh, say thank you again very much for a fascinating, fascinating presentation, um, which, uh, and I suspect this might have been your intention, is the tip of the iceberg and is wetting our appetites <laughs> to... <laughs> to follow up and learn more on uh, on this fascinating, fascinating subject that you found. Uh, so thank, thank you, Dr. You so uh, thank Dr. you. Dr. Dietz. Um, just want to remind everyone that next month we are going to be meeting in person at the Ann Arbor District Library in March, uh, but it will also be streamed. Uh, and the program is with Lisa McDonald, uh, who is the owner of the Tea House in Ann Arbor and also has just written, co-authored a book on the history and the health benefits of tea, the world's second most popular beverage. So with that, uh, we will say goodbye and uh, everyone, have a great evening. And thank you thank to you. the Harvard District Library. That's thank all. you, everybody. And please email me if you have any more questions. Come visit Stratford. Be like, I was on that Zoom and I'll comp your tickets. Come to the kitchen. Come to some of our Foodways programs in person and check out our YouTube channel. Thank you so much.